The advice and opinions expressed by the hosts of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as a suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. We're here. We're glitchy, but we're here and we want to be here. So thrilled to be with you this morning. We're going to be with you live for the next two hours talking about autism from a 360 degree perspective. And I couldn't be happier about that. It's the last day of September. And so things are changing for us. Things are changing for our kids. And we're going to be talking about that and ever so much more and some exciting things going on around the world. Uh, but Kelby, and just a second here is going to help me to remind you that there are lots of different ways for you to participate in this show because the whole show is meant to be interactive. We want you to participate with your thoughts, your feelings, your concerns, and your questions. So uh, Kelby is showing you, and I'll remind you that our homepage is autism-live.com. And then there are lots of other ways to get a hold of us here. But if you go to autism-live.com, you'll see a bunch of different things starting tomorrow. I've got to, I'm going to have a new blog up with a new recipe for the fall that's exciting you know i always talk to you guys about when the seasons change our food has to change too right uh mother earth tells us there are different colors to be eating and sometimes we get a little dissatisfied with our food around these seasonal changes and so do our kids we've gotten used to eating all the the bounty of the summer but now there's some other things and some other colors that are prime and they're available in the grocery stores. Uh, the things that are marked down and are on sale are usually the things that are seasonal. So isn't that a wonderful thing? We can eat healthy and eat very low cost. So we're going to be talking about that and there's going to be a new blog tomorrow with a new recipe that I think you guys are going to love. My child scarfed it up last night like it was the, you know, the last food that was ever going to be. So uh, that's a good sign. And my husband ate it too. So that's the ultimate sign. Um, but anyway, uh, other things to do on that page, you can be watching the live show or recently recorded live shows. There's a playlist on the computer screen in the corner. You can click on that and cycle back through and see, oh, you know, I wanted to see last Thursday's show because I wanted to hear what Dr. Jonathan Tarbox had to say about this, that, or the other thing, right? Now, to the side of that, there is a series of white boxes there, and one of them says your question. That's where I want you to put your cursor and start typing and hit enter, and it will show up here on the screen. Now, depending on what time you're watching the show, we may not be live, but it'll still show up here, and then I can address it on the next live show. Uh, we love it when you guys interact with us. And when you are watching us live, you have an opportunity to talk with our experts in almost real time. There's about a two minute lag from when you push enter to when it shows up here. So make sure you ask your questions early in a segment with an expert. Uh, we remind you that that's totally free totally anonymous. Nobody's asking you to log in. There's no lengthy process where you have to remember a password and ay ay ay, right? Who can remember all those <laughs> username and password for this? Ah, I can't remember. Uh, we don't want you to have to worry about that. We just want you to be able to ask your question. Now, the good side of that is that nobody knows who you are or where you are. The bad side of that is if you want me to get back to you with information from an expert, I have no way of getting back to you. So if you want to, you can include uh, personal information like an email address or even phone numbers or a snail mail address and that way we have the option of getting back to you uh, we will not share that with the audience at home so that's entirely up to you if you want to do that but that a lot of people do that and um, we do get back to you sometimes it takes a little bit longer sometimes it's quick be patient and if we don't get back to you with any speed and you see that you know sometimes there'll be a glitch and something will go away ask frequently 
um, and remind me, because I'm an autism parent, which brings me to my next thing, uh, that we have lots of experts that are here on the show that talk about autism, and I am not one of them. I am not an expert in autism. Just want to be really clear about that right from the get-go. I'm a parent. And my son was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and a half. He is now 11, and he is just... I'm so proud of him. I'm going to get welled up and emotional already three seconds into the show. But he's wonderful and he's doing fabulously. And I don't for a second think that that is just luck or that it is, uh, you know, that I got lucky somehow or that I know for sure it wasn't that we had money to pay for the best treatment because that wasn't the case. We did get lucky, though, in that we got good information. And good information led us to be able to take the actions that got us the best therapy and the funding for the best therapy that there is available from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. We got quality ABA. And I want to remind you here at the start of the show that CARD is not the only organization that does quality ABA. There are lots of organizations that do quality ABA. I speak lovingly about CARD because they gave me back my child. And that is the long and the short of it. But we talk here about everything under the sun to help you get the information that you need, which is going to look different than the information that I needed, which is going to look different than your friend Trudy's information and Bob's information over there, uh, right? It's not one size fits all. But I want you to know that the, the main purpose of this show is to get you the information that you need. And in order for us to do that, you have to tell us what you need. Sometimes you don't know what you need, which is why you tune in to hear what other people need, which gives you an idea of what you need, right? All right. It's convoluted, but it made sense to me. Hopefully it made sense to you. I hope you participate with us. I know I'm learning on this journey. You guys teach me and I learn from you and from our guests and together we hold hands and we get through this. That's the important thing. Doesn't matter if you're a parent, teacher, practitioner, or you yourself are the person on the autism spectrum. If you're here with us, we welcome you and we hope that you will be a part of this conversation so that we all get to that progress all about the progress, uh, the journey, right? Uh, we don't know where we're all going to end up, but the journey is the fun part. Okay, so we like to start every morning with something we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym. We try to make sense of it when the experts are talking to us and saying these terms, and we go, huh, what, huh? Well, I have no idea what you're talking about. Seems like it's fairly important. You're asking me to throw all my eggs into this basket, and this is what's going to help our family. So it'd be nice if I knew what the heck it was you're talking about. So today is a perfect example of one of these terms that gets batted around. And quite honestly, I think my son was maybe in the third year of therapy before I really truly got what we were talking about with this. So uh, lots of autism parents out there, if you're, you know, you may say, I've been around the block a couple of times, I'm pretty familiar, and this may be still something that eludes you, and it's such, <laughs> this is the cornerstone to so many good things. Okay, so it's FBA. I used to say, you know, that FBI thing. Uh, and I know other people who say FAB because it's fab. It is fab. All right, so let's take a look at what our actual definition of an FBA is. An FBA is a functional behavior assessment. It's a multi-step problem-solving assessment process designed to, term, to, designed to determine the function of a behavior. Okay, we talk about this all the time on the show, that everything that we all do, uh, we're all engaging in behavior right now, so are our kids, so are our teenagers, so are our adults, whether they're neurotypical or they are on the autism spectrum. Everybody is engaging in behavior. So what's the function of a behavior? The function of the behavior is, I, what I like to think of it in my head is, what's the paycheck for the behavior? We don't do behaviors uh, again and again and again unless there's some benefit to it. So let's take a look at what our working definition of an FBA is, it's an essential process that helps us understand why a challenging behavior is happening so that we can change it effectively. Let's say that a child is knocking things off the dining room table. They just come along every morning and they're wiping it off and it happens on a fairly regular basis. So it's a problem, right? Because eventually you say, well, we can't have anything on the table. And yet, so, you know, you find, and we all find ways to function, right? So we see that the family is sitting on the floor eating their dinner. 
to get around this problem. And good behavioral therapists will say to us, well, let's figure out what's happening. Why is this behavior happening? What's the paycheck for this? We wanna figure out what the function of the behavior is. And I always think of that um, Schoolhouse Rock um, conjunction junction, what's your function? I'm always looking at behavior going, function, function, what's your function? Why is this happening? What's the paycheck? So an FBA is that multi-step process that tries to determine effectively what is the paycheck for it. We talk talked last week about the four usual suspects, that there's four reasons why our kids on the autism spectrum generally do the behaviors that they do. To get attention, and remember that even bad attention is good attention when you're seeking attention. To get escape from something, you want to get out of doing something or get away from someone to get access to someone or something, right? You want that cookie, so you behave that way. And the last one is because there's something about it that feels good. We see that sometimes, you know, kids will engage in a behavior, and we all do this all the time, the pen clicking, uh, you know, somebody who twirls their hair, there's something about it that feels good. The paycheck in is the, what it feels like, and it can be internal or external, but what it feels like. So we need to know which one of those, it's probably one of those four things or a combo platter of those, why this individual is swiping things off the table. It could be that they're swiping things off the table to see the reaction on mom's face when mom goes, ah, don't do that, right? Maybe that is fulfilling in some way for the child. Um, and maybe afterwards the mom spends time with the child picking up all the things that were on the table and the child wants that attention from mom. It could be that the child is swiping things off the table because they want access to something that's in the middle of the table and they can't reach it. So by swiping everything off the table, they can get at the thing on the table. Huh? Or it could be that they're swiping things off the table so that the babysitter has to get mom out of the back of the house and say, you have to come out and deal with this. And they, what they wanted was mom, right? It could be that there is something visually or, um, you know, the sound of the crashing china on the floor sounds great and is reinforcing. So that would be the automatically reinforcing. Or it could be that this child is being asked to do their homework and they don't want to do their homework, so they swipe everything off the table and now there's a postponement of doing the homework because we have to pick up the stuff. And they didn't get to, they, they got five minutes where they got to postpone the homework. Now, stop and consider that if you knew which one of those things uh, was what the function of the behavior was, then your intervention would be vastly different than if it was another one, right? Because if it's that they want attention, if that's what they want to get, is that mom face that mom made, and believe me, there's lots of different ways you get attention from swiping off a table. If what they want is for mom to make that face, as long as mom keeps making that face, guess what's gonna happen? They're gonna keep swiping things off the table. But what happens if mom stops making that face? If mom keeps her face completely neutral, there's no yelling and there's no attention whatsoever that happens because of this thing. The child's probably gonna do it a couple of more times and then they're gonna stop doing it because they're not getting, they're gonna find some other way to get and we wanna give them attention when it's not happening so that they don't have the need to do that, right? But that's vastly different than what we would do if they were trying to swipe things off the table to get to the cookie on the table. If what they want is the cookie in the center of their table, then we're only gonna give them the cookie when they ask for it appropriately and don't do this. So what the function of the behavior is drives what the intervention is. And when we know the right function of the behavior, our researchers have done all the research for, research for us so that we have a whole host, a list of things that we can do that we know are scientifically effective. We just find the right one to work for that behavior. And we get efficient. That is what happens when we get efficient. So when are you gonna use an FBA? If your child is engaging in a challenging behavior in your home and you go, I can't handle this. And it could be whatever, they're not going to sleep, they're biting their sister, they throw a tantrum every time you walk into a certain grocery store, they won't take a bath. You need to know what the function of the behavior is before you can effectively nip that behavior in the bud and have something more uh, 
acceptable kind of behavior happening. They're all, they're communicating something to you. They might, the communication might be, I need you to pay attention to me. I want that thing. I don't want that thing, or this feels good. We need to know what that is before we can intervene. And that's what the FBA does for us. For those of you who have school age children and you go to pick up the child and uh, the teacher says, oh, you know, He's hitting again. He hit the girl next to him, and we really need to get this to stop, or we're going to expel him, or we're going to put him in another classroom, or la di la di la di, right? You know, all these different things. We want to request of the school for them to do an FBA. That's the first thing. If you see a note come home and it's something that has, you know, if it's happened more than once, ask for an FBA. And ask for it in writing, get the school, either psychologist or the, they, a lot of schools now have a BCBA on staff, get them to do an FBA. And then, at, once they know the function of the behavior, you should be able to sit down with them and help them to write an effective behavior intervention plan based on the FBA. And with those two things, your child's behavior will change. If you've got the right function and the right behavior intervention, it will change. And sometimes that makes the difference of whether your child succeeds. It makes the difference of their setting. It makes the difference of everything. So one of the most important things, FBA, Functional Behavior Assessment, it's a multi-process, uh, uh, essential multi-step process that helps us to figure out what the function of the behavior is. And we never want to waste time putting a behavior intervention into effect unless we know what the function is. It's once you understand all that, you go, oh, why would we intervene in something until we know what the function is? Because we're just throwing spaghetti on the wall and seeing what sticks. Let's be effective. We know this is what gets us effective. And by the way, if you want to play around with this a little bit, go to skills bipbuilder.com. I'm pretty sure that that's what it is. Skillsbipbuilder.com. And try, they have something called a CIFA there, which can walk you through a process that's like an FBA to figure out the function of behavior. And then they give you all drop down menus that show you all the interventions that will be effective for that function. Oh, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, never go to another meeting at a school where they're planning the, the behavior intervention plan without that. Oh, it's just life changing. Okay, FBA, it's an amazing thing when you know what it is. All right, moving on. We always have a question of the day for you. I'm so far behind today. Uh, so our question for you today, and we hope you'll answer for us on Facebook, is what support do you need? We're talking about you. What do you need? Do you need someone to help you organize your paperwork? Do you need somebody to help you with your clutter? Do you need somebody to help you to know how to use skills? Do you need someone to help you to understand how to deal with your child's tantrums? What support do you need? Or do you just need someone to listen? We want to hear from you. What is it that you need right now? Okay. So moving on to, uh, we always have a topic of the week and our topic this week is getting support and all the different ways and shapes that support will present itself. It's so important that we prioritize getting support for ourselves and for our families. We, a lot of times, for those of you who are parents out there, you know what I'm talking about and I speak as a parent. So I, I, <laughs> I, I admit, I tell on myself that we frequently, we say that we're important and we know that we're important to the family. We know that we're essential and we, we stay up all night worrying about what will happen when we're not here. And yet when it comes down to brass tacks in a given day, I would never send my son off to school without a lunch. It just wouldn't happen. But I leave work you know, uh, without having had lunch and without having fed myself at least twice a week. Um, and we as parents need to remember that what we would not allow ourselves to do for our children, we, we need to get the support that we need and support ourselves and ask for what we need help with so that we are also supported. Otherwise, we're not around to stick around and help with the things happening at home. So we're going to talk about that um, in all different... Everybody needs support. 
everybody needs support and how we can find what support we need and access to it. So uh, some of the different guests that we have here on the show today, so excited and my, my thing isn't coming up. But we have Janice Kern is going to be with us in just a second and she is going to be talking with us about the upcoming this weekend TACA, TACA convention that is happening for the West Coast. Oh, my goodness. If you are on the West Coast, this is a must do, must attend. Uh, so Janice is going to be joining us via Skype to talk about that. Then after that, we have Sue Cho with us. She hasn't been with us for a while, but you guys will remember Sue Cho. And she's going to be talking with us about a whole host of different things, not the least of which is how we implement technology for our kids, and depending on where they are and how it can be so effective with some of our kids who are more profoundly affected. Really important discussion. She's also going to let us know what she's been doing with yoga with her kids. She travels the world and works with children literally all around the globe. And she's going to talk to us about what that's been like and the opportunity for those of you who are thinking about becoming a therapist, what that might be like for you if you're interested. You know, there's always the option for travel. And then we've been uh, sitting on this for a while, a lovely young woman from England, who uh, not only has an autism spectrum uh, diagnosis, but has some other things going on along with that, but an amazing young woman who lets nothing stop her, Courtney Reeve. We have an interview that we taped with her a while back, and we are so thrilled to show you this inspirational young woman and what she's doing to help herself and to help others and to bring awareness, not only to autism, but to Tourette's and uh, cerebral palsy as well. Amazing amazing young woman. I promise you, you'll be inspired by her. So we're going to take a break and then we're going to be joined by Janice Kern. So stick with us. high functioning autism and I'd say I noticed somewhere between nine months and a year. Looking back now I can tell you everything. I mean there was no pointing, there was no shared experiences, speech was not coming, the interactive play was not coming, those things weren't happening. You know you go to the pediatrician they tell you well sometimes boys are slow or things might take a while to come along but it still wasn't happening and right when he hit the two-year-old room in preschool is when the wheels fell off the wagon. That's when we got some intervention. That's when we uh, figured out, you know, how are we gonna address this problem? The first thing I did was I got a mentor because there's no book on what to do with your autistic child. I mean, there's many books, but your, each path is individual. So I got a mentor, a really nice woman named Marlene. She has a daughter with Asperger's, and she told me, go to psychiatrist so you can have your child fully diagnosed and a rock solid diagnosis that can't really be attacked, call card and do whatever they tell you to do. <laughs> that was probably the thing she talked about the most. Get in touch with card. And she actually put me in touch with Evelyn from card and calling card was like amazing because you really, I really felt like things were finally going to be okay. We were going to get the help we needed. We tried a, a number of different things before we could get into CARD, and you could really see the difference in the data keeping, really addressing what his issues were, whereas the other places we had been, it seemed pointless to me. We've talked about this, and I feel like we, we met a lot of really nice, well-intentioned people. Right. And then when we got to CARD, we met a lot of really nice people who could help us because they had the experience. It was ABA, which I think is the only way to go with your child if you're trying to overcome autism. And if you go to CARD, the people are so qualified and there's so much of a database on how to approach this. It's just like they come right in and we started off with, let's have Riley sit down for two seconds because he couldn't even get that and we worked on baby steps until now he's in first grade and he's working at grade level. So it just starts with baby steps and it keeps working on because they have a way to approach every single problem, every single tantrum, every single thing you're gonna come up with. They have a way to approach it and help you get through it. Yeah, I'm always Riley amazed like at our, our clinic, we'll be having a specific problem and, and how good they are, um, all of them, the therapists and your team leader at coming up with a solution, something to try and it almost always works. Whatever the particular behavior you're trying to deal with, uh, they're really good at them. They know the answers. 
He likes a lot of stuff I think regular seven-year-olds like. He likes to swim. He loves to um, swim. He's a fish. Likes to uh, ride a scooter. Loves Toy Story. Loves playing on the iPad. Justin Bieber. Thought you all be mine. Good job, buddy. High five. High five. Oh High God. five. Yeah. Card's been good about encouraging us to do things that maybe wouldn't occur to us, like him learning to ride a bike was really them saying, hey, it's time, let's do this, and helping us do that and so he can ride a bike. He's still working on, on the brakes a little bit, but you know, he can pedal a bike, we can go to Balboa Park and he'll, he'll ride happy as a clam along the bike path. If you think something's wrong, it's not about you. Don't bury your head in the sand. Go get help, because the help is out there to make your life and your child's life just so much better. And if you're lucky enough to get in with CARD, I can't even tell you what a difference it's made in our lives from four years ago. Just the quality of life we have, the quality of life Riley has, the progress he's made from being a child who wanted to stay in his room and play Toy Story and line up his Toy Story dolls all day to a first grader who was working at grade level. It couldn't have happened without card intervention, without ABA, and without all the wonderful people we met. Welcome back to Smarty. This month we're going to be creating a popsicle puzzle. As we do this fun activity, you'll notice these icons will pop up. These icons tell you important information about the skills we're using to create the craft and where you can find them on the skills program. Skills is an ABA based tool that helps parents create a curriculum that will help their children that are on the autism spectrum. Well, let's get started. The materials you'll be needing are popsicle sticks, tape, and arts and crafts materials. So step one, you're gonna take your popsicle sticks and lay them down and cover them with tape so they don't move around. Now that my popsicle sticks have been secured with tape, here comes the fun part. You're gonna take your arts and crafts materials, they can be paint, markers, whatever you have, and then you're gonna decorate this with a beautiful picture. This is the beautiful picture that I made. Now what I'm going to do is remove the tape. And now, as you can see, they come apart. And here is your awesome puzzle. Now, the fun part is trying to assemble the picture that you just made now that it's all been separated. I hope you enjoyed this activity with me. Until next time, guys, craft on. To find more about skills and to access all of the lessons you saw in today's Smarty, visit skillsforautism.com and click on the parent icon, Skills, the online autism solution. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm so thrilled because joining us for the first time here on the show is Janice Kern. She's coming to us all the way from North Dakota uh, via Skype. Janice, welcome to Autism Live. Thank you. And Janice, you are the uh, conference coordinator for TACA, an organization that we love here on Autism Live. And you've got your second conference of the year coming up this coming weekend, and it happens to be the West Coast Conference. Uh, we want to encourage anybody who's sitting on the fence about this to get to this conference that's happening in Costa Mesa, California. It's this weekend starting on Friday. And I was hoping, Janice, you could tell our viewers viewers why why there's a lot of conferences out there but why should they go to a TACA conference it is different when you're at a TACA conference there it, TACA has things that other conferences don't offer I Especially wholeheartedly in agree of yes in-person support TACA volunteers will be at this conference ready to hold hands 
if you are new to the autism journey, as well as share the latest research if you've been on the autism journey for a number of years. Most people love Taka's information online. It's even better in person. Yeah, I always say whenever I go anywhere, any autism event, I look for the Taka table because that's where all the Taka moms and dads are and they're having more fun than anybody else. And not only just having fun, they're getting more done because they're working together and getting information out. It's, it's really kind of amazing. And then to imagine all of that in one conference where it's all that is pretty spectacular. And I want to, and you guys also give a work Workbook at your conferences. So talk to our viewers about what that workbook is. The workbook is contains all of the PowerPoint presentations for every presenter so that you can follow along with every presenter right in front of you and take your own notes. Then the hope is that that conference workbook is yours to keep and serves you as an ongoing resource long after the conference is over. Yeah, it's pretty amazing and it, it makes the experience because a lot of times you can get overwhelmed and sometimes if a speaker is going a little faster and they go past a slide and you didn't get all the information down, you know, it's that anxiety. So knowing that it's all there opens you up to listening and learning, which is, it's just brilliant. It's so well thought out because it's thought out by parents. It's just wonderful. And then talk to us about what track one and track two mean because they're two very vital things that happen at those TACA conferences. Track one is aimed at parents or professionals who are newer to the autism journey. Maybe you're a parent whose child was very recently diagnosed, then that is, that's the track that's aimed at helping you. So the information is less overwhelming, it's more basic, it's where you want to start your autism journey. If you are new, even if your child has been diagnosed more than a year ago, but you're just really getting into treatments or therapies, diet, inter any intervention, you're really just getting your feet wet into those areas, that track is aimed at you. Track two is for families who've been on the autism journey more than a couple of years. You've tried a couple of different dietary interventions and now you wanna take it a step further uh, or you are familiar with therapies and this that track is for you. Track two is more advanced. Or if you have an older child, that track is for you. And, and people get to decide which track they want to be on, right? So that They do. We get asked a lot, <laughs> which track should I attend? Yeah. And then we'll ask just a couple of basic questions, and usually people can fit into one track or the other. Yeah. Uh, there is a chance that uh, people can s maybe move into another track for one particular presentation, but for the most part, parents can usually fit into track one or track two. It's usually pretty clear. Yeah, it's it's a really amazing thing. And we want to mention that there's two different ways that they can access more information about the conferences that are coming up. While we're talking, Kelby's going to make sure that you have a Facebook page um, that's that uh, you can uh, be checking out more information about not only this TACA conference, but you have another one that's coming up for the Midwest in November, correct? Yes, that will be in St. Paul, Minnesota. Okay, and so uh, so we're not only, we want to make sure that you get this uh, address, but there is also a .org address um, the, where you can get more information and register for these conferences. But let's go back, Janice, to talking about this one this weekend because you have an amazing lineup of guests at this conference. Talk to us we about do. who's going to be there. We do. We have a great combination including parents who are on the autism journey, a little bit of a celebrity action with the Loritas coming, mm -hmm. Chris and Jacqueline Lorita from, they have been on the reality TV show, um, Housewives of New Jersey. Yes. And their son is diagnosed with autism. And so they're living the autism journey like the rest of us, but they're doing it in front of a million viewers. And so they have a perspective of their own autism journey that'll be interesting for all of us to hear about. And they've also had their son's journey on television, which most of us don't have that happen to us. Yeah. And so that will be a fun way to start our Saturday morning to hear from their perspective. On Friday, we'll be hearing from parents 
and doctors. And on Saturday, we have parents, doctors, legal experts, lawyers, and educational professionals as well. People that can help with insurance, IEP information, lots of topics. The thing about these conferences is that no matter what you walk into, we were talking earlier today about getting support and how important it is to get support. And sometimes people need legal support, sometimes they need emotional support, sometimes they need biomedical support, sometimes they need behavioral support, sometimes they just need somebody to hold their hand. And the wonderful thing about going to a TACA Real Help Now conference is it's all available to you. Yes, it is. All available to you. That is an you. exact description. We have it all covered because we've all been there. We're yep. all still living it. Yep. And it's absolutely something that's life changing. I can't tell you how many times people have said, I went to this conference. It changed the course of what we were doing. It was life changing and life changing for the better. So again, we want people to know they can still register to come to this weekend's conference. And for those of you who are in other parts of the country, you can still register to go to the one in November. Now I know Taka is really good about offering scholarships for people people who, uh, you know, uh, want to come and demonstrate that they want to come and have a need. I, but I think at this point, you probably can only register for a uh, scholarship for the Midwest. Is that correct? You could still register for a scholarship for this conference. We could make that happen if there was a need. It should, you should also know that if you register online still until Thursday, it's $25 less than if you register on site. Okay. So pre-registering online is pretty simple and it can save you some money on registration. Okay. I just applaud you. This is absolutely wonderful. It's so exciting. I hope that you have more people than you know what to do with there because, I do too. <laughs> because you guys give all of us so much hope uh, to continue on and re refresh the batteries. So uh, please give my love to everyone that's there. And then I can't, I can't wait to hear about everything. And thank you so much for being with us on very short notice, Janice. Thank you for having me. Oh, thrilled to have you. So have a good weekend. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, so again, Taka, and for those of you, uh, you know, you can also go to their blog. And as we talk about support this week, there is no finer organization that supports autism parents and families than Taka. I am a huge fan of theirs, and Taka has been there for me when I have needed them in so many different ways. I get all the clump talking about it. Um, and don't be embarrassed. If you need a scholarship to get to this, please please apply for a scholarship. I have benefited from TACA scholarships before in the past. Uh, and you know, you feel funny when you're first filling out the thing, but if that's what you need, I'm telling you, please do it. Please make that difference for yourself and for your family. Be there. It will be life-changing for you. TACA Real Help Now conferences. If you can't get to this one, but you can get to the one in November, do it. And then uh, they'll have one on the East Coast again sometime in the spring. So talk a Real Help Now conferences, ooh, good stuff. We're gonna be right back after these messages. Hi, I'm Ryan with Autism Research Group. We study ways to improve the lives of kids with autism. One of those ways is teaching safety skills, such as what to do if they get lost. We hit the streets to find out if anybody knows the correct answer on how to teach a kid what to do if they get lost. You're teaching a child. What to do if they get lost. Yeah, you're trying to okay. make them independent so they have the skills. Gotcha, okay. So I'll give them a compass. Code name's good idea, Centurion. We always have this whistle. <laughs> um. Oh, I'd also out, tell the kid, like... I tell the kid, don't get scared. It's all, you're going to be all right, man. This is just the world. You're, this is planet Earth. You're at home here. As long as you're on planet Earth, you're at home. As long as you're on planet Earth, you're home. This guy's a genius. With that flawless logic, he just solved our homeless problem. And as for the unique sounding whistle, although very cool, it'll probably only work if you're in close proximity. And a compass. I have her call me. Yeah, she doesn't have a phone. Parents are like, you're too young, you don't need a phone. Establish some sort of like meeting place. What if they can't find a meeting place? Because sometimes Ooh. the kids get nervous when they get lost. 
yeah. like a backup plan, well, like well, plan B. Yeah, I don't know. No, not really. Let him go and find a new kid. Or something. <laughs> yeah, I've got a different one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's not much you can do. There is I stuff like... you can do. I... That's right, there is stuff you can do. In 2012, myself, along with my colleagues, Dr. Jonathan Tarbox and Dr. Adele Nadowski, published a study in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis on teaching kids what to do when they get lost. The study demonstrated how three simple things, rules, role playing, and praise, were effective in establishing these help-seeking behaviors. The benefit of this method is it doesn't require the child to have a cell phone or to have to locate a meeting place, which might be difficult if they're in a place like Disneyland. So once again, our method included rules, role playing, and praise. Let's head back outside and learn about some of these rules. They should yell out loud. Can't find my mom! My mom, help me! Maybe yell out and scream for help. Alright. Scream really loud. Correct. And if that doesn't work, then... I don't know. Well, they could seek help from someone. Find an adult. Yeah, go to a vendor, you know, and say I'm lost. Or... Find an adult, like a police officer, or a fireman, or an employee in the store, and tell them, and maybe they can help you contact your parent. It really is that simple. You don't need to get your kid a cell phone. You don't need to establish a meeting place that they might not be able to find when they're lost and panicking. And you definitely don't need to give them a compass. All your kid has to do is three things. First, yell mom or dad real loud. Two, if that doesn't work, find an employee. And then third, tell the employee they're lost. If they can't locate an employee, then tell them to find a mother with children because that's probably the safest person to approach. I'm not saying that most men are predators, but most predators are men. That is a fact. I've read it in a fortune cookie. All right, so you've gotten all the rules with your kid and you've quizzed them and they're able to tell you the correct responses so they understand the rules, but is that enough? How do you know they're gonna perform correctly in a real world setting? You need to get out there and find out if they can actually do it. So they'd go over the rules and tell them like, do this, do that, but how would you know if they actually knew what to do? If you wanted to shoot a basketball and I just told you, oh, when you shoot a basketball, do this, this, and this. I never, never practice. You never not practice. Happen. Yeah, so it don't matter how many times we go over the rules or how well you can repeat them back to me, it's not going to change until you get on the court and practice. Maybe do uh, like a, you know, a little skit with them. Like a role play. Like... Role play. Yeah. Your child, you're lost in the toy aisle. Okay. What do you do? I'm an attendant walking around. <laughs> I'm lost. I don't know where my mom is. And then once you practice, you just like praise them, give them feedback, like, good job, you did it. Yes, this woman wins the prize for best comment. She pointed out the most important part of learning, reinforcement. Now, in our study, we used praise, but for your kid, you might have to use something else. You might have to buy them a treat, a toy, take them to their favorite restaurant where they can eat unhealthy food and run around and climb through plastic tunnels that have the unmistakable scent of urine and then play games spending $20 to get a plastic little spider ring that they will eventually lose in the ball pit. The point is, you need to reward your child for correctly demonstrating what you've been teaching them. Okay, I'm gonna call her. Uh, hello, your child, Ryan. I was just doing this thing. Yay! So you tested it out I'll in the out. store <laughs> to make sure I knew it. I had the rules, yes. we role played it and you made sure I knew it, and then like you said, good job, and all that. Now we're good to go. We're good to go. All right. Done? High five right there. <laughs> yeah. So there you have it. Give your child the rules, get out there and practice, and reward your child for responding correctly. For more information, please visit us online at autismresearchgroup.org. I'm Ryan Bergstrom. Thanks for watching. Yes, ding, no. <laughs> Yes, this woman wins the first. Yes, this woman. Yes, this woman wins the best. Yes, this woman wins the first place. Yes, this woman. Why can't I say what? Yes, this woman wins. What's the line? Yes. Welcome back to Autism Live. If I have a goofy grin on my face, it's because I just adore our next guest. We're here with Sue Cho, who works for Institute for Behavioral Training, and she is a senior clinical trainer. Amazing, amazing. But you've seen her before on some of the videos that we've done. She is just one of those brilliant people who works with our kids. She's a wealth of knowledge, and we don't get to see her that often, so I love it when you're here, and love that we have an opportunity to talk with you. 
thanks for being here. But I want to, uh, there's three things in particular that I want to talk with you about. And the first one is the use of technology. Mm -hmm. That uh, this is an area where a lot of times parents are a little bit afraid, but technology, you've seen this as you've traveled around the world, can be something that's really beneficial for our kids. And not just the kids who are super duper high functioning, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. So, so tell us a little bit about how you've used technology with different kids and what changes you've seen have come mm -hmm. as a result. So, I mean, we don't have enough time to tell you I know. all the possible directions that we could go with this, but technology has been such a godsend for our kids, I think, on so many levels, mm -hmm. whether it be the child that's struggling with vocal communication or children where we're struggling to get their attention or find them independent activities to do. Mm -hmm. So there are lots and lots of things that I think the technology has helped considerably to give them more independence and freedom. And I think a lot of times, especially for our younger kids, what we hear from parents is that they're squeamish about if somebody starts talking to them about, oh, we want to get them an iPad to start to teach them to communicate using the iPad, a lot of times the parents feel like it's a second death. Mm -hmm. Okay, first my child was diagnosed with autism, now you're telling me they're not going to talk. That's what they're hearing in that moment, but that's really not what they should be hearing, right? In fact, it's if anything, I think that more people should be considering it as a tool rather than a crutch mm -hmm. because it's really assisting our kids, especially the ones that were are struggling with developing independent communication to develop a voice. Whether that be maybe they're difficult to understand because their speech isn't very clear, mm -hmm. or maybe they don't have any functional communication at all, that it really allows them quick access to be able to communicate. And of course, the goal with all of the children is to fade that stimulus out over time too. So um, I found that a lot of children that we've been working with immediately start vocalizing more. And because many times the voice that they're hearing on the device is exactly the same, then they're getting more practice and repetition with the same voice. And many times children are vocalizing quite a bit more. And so, of course, anytime we're using technology, again, it's an assist. It's, the intention is not to fully replace the vocal communication, I think, that which is really important for a lot of families and children, too. Um, it's just the assist. It's just that tool that's going to help them jump to the next step. Okay, so. so we should be embracing the technology wherever our children are and asking ourselves, how could technology help this child? And I think, you know, you have a book to write. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we want from you is a book about all the different ways to include technology for our kids. So mm -hmm. no pressure, but get started on that. <laughs> uh, I want to move on to talk about, because I promised the last time you were here we were going to talk about yoga. Yes. And we didn't get to it. No, we didn't. And that's right. such a big, big bummer because mm -hmm. you are an amazing person who does yoga and you have seen a transformation happen as you begin to use this with your kiddos that you uh, uh, are see on a regular basis talk to us about that absolutely I mean there are so many applications to yoga and more and more people are doing it mm -hmm. and I think that um, especially with our kids some of the first kids that I started doing yoga in their treatment plans we were working on just physical coordination mm -hmm. um, maybe they were struggling with their posture or being able to coordinate multiple movements or motor planning and started seeing that some of these children were actually developing better body awareness mm -hmm. um, I have an example of a, a client that I worked with where he actually slumped over quite a bit whenever he was talking to people part of it was because of his motor strength his core strength and then the other issue too was just confidence. Mm -hmm. And so we implemented yoga into this program um, once a day. So he would just do like six to 12 different movements that we taught the therapist how to do. Mm -hmm. And within the course of a month, he was standing up wow. taller. And, um, and he was also just much better aware of his body. So he was able to be around people. He would much more easily without falling into them. I think it a largely had to do with the movements that he was doing, just mm -hmm. he developed more body awareness. And if you've ever tried to do a new exercise as an adult, you know, many times until we get used to practicing and developing that memory and that repetition, um, we, it's, it's cumbersome and we don't even necessarily know where our body is too. So again, the practice has really helped a lot of kids do that for sure. And I'm wondering, cause I'm hearing this and I'm saying, okay, I need to do this with Jem. Mm -hmm. I need to do this with him. But two things as I, you know, I'm uncoordinated. Um, so do I need to take him to a class or do I need to get a video? What would you recommend for there us? Lots of different options okay. for kids. I think that there's a lot of really good things on the internet. Um, uh -huh. as far as YouTube video classes, 
clips, um, yoga videos of kids, even looking at sites with different poses. Okay. Um, and honestly, you don't have to be flexible because that's a misconception about yoga. Mm -hmm. yoga. Regardless of your age, your physical abilities, etc., many things can be adapted. So, okay. And it can be as simple as you start with one pose. And, and just... so we could do this ourselves at home without Absolutely. having a yoga master yes. there. We could give it a whirl and see. And I'm wondering what it does for focus. Because mm -hmm. the first thing that I always thought about with yoga is, well, you know, he doesn't have enough focus to do mm -hmm. that. But if mm -hmm. I'm not working on it, how are we going to ever get to the focus? Mm -hmm. Does it help kids to, to be stand still and be fo be focused in that Absolutely, way? Absolutely, yes, definitely. Okay. Because, because one of the other things that we really focus on in yoga is breath mm. and you need to breathe all the time we so unconsciously do it all the time and yeah. that's why we're alive but when you suddenly take something that's so involuntary and then start really focusing yeah. your mind on it and um, just focusing your attention to it I believe that has really helped a lot of children develop better awareness with what's right in front of them. And that's got to help with anxiety mm -hmm. issues Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, okay. if you think too about some of the coping strategies that we use ourselves yeah. and then we try to teach our kids where use deep breathing. Yeah. And, you know, again, going back to breathing. I know for myself that when I'm finding that I'm having a hard time focusing on something, one of the first things that I do is concentrate on my breathing. Mm -hmm and become more conscious of my breathing and think about breathing. Yeah. You know, something again that's so involuntary that we just automatically do and same for the kids too. So you can start off at any level for any amount of time too. Okay. Think that, you know, again, small incremental steps rather than I'm going to do an hour every day. Well, rather than that, if you're just starting, just work on breathing for 10 breaths even. Okay. And anyone can do Yes. Anything for 10 breaths. So we don't have to be able so. to do a headstand? No, you don't have to be able to do a headstand <laughs> and you don't have to be able to do a handstand. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, the last thing that I wanted to talk with Sue about, uh, we've been talking to you on the show about we need more therapists yes, in the world. We really the do. The therapist needs more, more uh, the world needs more therapists. And the truth of the matter is, is there are a whole lot of people out there watching who need good jobs. Mm -hmm. And I, I had a little break with them last week talking about all the benefits of being a therapist and all the things that you can do. But mm -hmm. one of the things I didn't really focus on is the opportunity to mm -hmm. travel. Oh, yes. And this is something that you can speak very mm -hmm. effectively about. How long have you been a therapist uh, in the field of autism? I started off as a therapist in the mid to early 90s. Okay, mm -hmm. so you've been doing this for a while, mm -hmm. and up until fairly recently, you were a world traveler yes. of the first order. <laughs> Talk to them about some of the places that you've been to mm -hmm. and that you've seen and experiences that you've had. I traveled all over the world, and I think as a child, I always wanted to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Whether it was across a state line to another city, I always wanted to see what else was out there. Mm -hmm. And so when the opportunities came, with working at, with working with CARD, um, where I could travel to places to set up programs for children, I immediately jumped at the opportunity. Um, some of the first places that I was going to were St. Louis. I went to Missouri for years. In fact, I still go there uh -huh. to see a client that I've been seeing since I started supervising, actually. Um, and then also to the Caribbean to see children and it sounds glamorous and at the same time it's very different it forces us to be flexible and mm -hmm. really ad adapt to different situations and work with what what's there uh -huh. you know because you go to some of the places um, and they don't have running water constantly yeah. or they don't have electricity all the time or you know we're worried about in the states maybe getting a powerpoint projector up and there i'm hoping that i have chalk for a chalkboard or maybe yeah. i can write it up on the wall somehow or something um, I went to Asia for a bit of time and um, helped start the affiliate site in South Africa, the Star Academy. Mm -hmm. That was in the late 2000s. And um, it's an amazing experience because you're coming into a place where this is the only ABA they know. No one yeah. else around them may even know what ABA is. Mm -hmm. And so some of the things that we may have been trying to struggle to get people to understand in the 90s, they're dealing with now. Yeah. And um, you know, reaching these people in a way that no one else possibly could just because it's not available to them. And I think that my heart has always been in providing help for people that couldn't access it. Mm -hmm. And so going to these places was an incredible experience. And I've seen it blossom and change too. Like for example, in the Caribbean I was going quite a while back and now I'm seeing people that have 
you know, potentially start using skills out there now. And because they can't necessarily pay for a supervisor come out to the Caribbean anymore, they at least had some of the training, now they can access e-learning. Right. They can use skills and they can affect the kids locally on a totally different level. And I think that it gives them a lot of hope too because a lot of parents say to me when I go to another location, we thought that this was only available where you had a site. Oh. And because we don't live close to one of your sites, we never thought we could access it. Yeah. So it's an amazing experience. Well, it's been an amazing gift that you've given to the world. And now you're traveling less because mm -hmm. different phases of different people's mm -hmm. lives. And it's not that you, if you want to be a therapist, you don't have to travel. Mm -hmm. But if you want to travel, the opportunity is there. Absolutely. To exotic places all over the world. Mm -hmm. You name it, there are people with autism who need help there. Absolutely. And there's an opportunity to go. Mm -hmm. And you have made a tremendous, I, you, it must feel so good because you've made such a tremendous difference in the world. Do you have any awareness of that? Do you have friends all over the world and children who love you all over the world and parents who love you because you've helped them to connect with their kids? That's a great, great legacy and you're still so young. I can't wait to see what you do with the rest of your life. Uh, but we're thrilled that you're working in the field of training now too and helping for other people to know how to do this. So if you want to be someone that I'm seeing, I'm all the clumped now. If you want to make a difference like Sue has and have that, uh, and all the frequent flyer miles that you have as well, you probably could fly the rest of your life uh, for free to go everywhere you want to go. If you want that, uh, you can have an opportunity to work with Sue as well because she could be somebody who's training you to help to train you. We thank you for being you and for doing all the things that you've done and for being with us today, because I know you have a full schedule, but you're remarkable. I just adore you. Thanks. I wanna, Thank want you. to clone her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in any case, it is time now for us to take a break and go to the A Word. This is an ongoing documentary being made by the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. And it gives you kind of a view into one family's home here in California. Uh, their son is Jack Riley. He was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. And at this point in the therapy, he's been having therapists come for a while. It's not always easy. And it's a very hard job being a therapist but it's very rewarding to see one of these little kiddos learn just like Jack Riley. So take a look. This is the A word. Sun's coming up. <laughs> How do you spell apple? Jack? A P P L E. <gasps> We went to the mall last night and got him some new shoes and uh, he, rode the, he rode the carousel and I watched him for like a half hour and you would never guess he wasn't like every other kid in there except he was smaller than a lot of them. <laughs> they run around with a... I so funny! Reckless abandon. It's so funny. Is that That's so funny. funny. Hey, what color do you want? Look, I have green, yellow, and pink. What color? Yellow. So what do you say? The high yellow. Yes, you can. Close. There we go. Oh! Uh-oh! Should we make him stand? I can come choppy. <gasps> Should we make him jump? Here, let's make him jump. Ready? Boink! Uh-oh! Look, what is that? See, it's a footprint. It's a footprint. It's a footprint. Cool, you wanna do it again? I take it! <laughs> While Jessica and Jack Riley are playing with Play-Doh, they are working on his fine motor skills. They include pincher grasp for picking up food, rotating the wrist for clasping and opening the door. Having fine motor skills are needed for daily living tasks. Oh, coolness! Wow! Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Whose birthday is it? So it's, so it's my... It's my... Birthday. Day. Say a birthday. Birthday. Say it's, um, it's my birthday. It's my birthday. Yeah. How old are you? It's my. I'm. I three. Yep. You're three. Do this. Say three. Three. One. Two. Look. Three fingers. Look. Right here. Look. One. Two. Three. three. Three fingers. Five fingers. Yeah, well, yeah, technically you do have five. What is that? <laughs> a rabbit. He's wearing a 
blue hat and a green hat and a red hat hat and a oops he's not wearing a hat yellow hat yeah it's a yellow hat red red, red shirt blue shirt yellow shirt green shirt yeah oops he's wearing it upside down it's it's a hippo and a dog good it's she rabbit and frog. Good. She pink and cow. Very good. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Why is tacting important? Tacting is important because it helps with language and conversation too. When we first start off, we just um, have him identify labels. He's a rebug. Uh -huh. And then we move into frames, like adding um, article adjectives to it, like it's the dog. What is it? Say it's uh, a chicken. Yeah, it's a chicken. And then now we're having him add um, two objects. So he has to say it's a blank and a blank. It's a pink egg cow. Very good. And then we'll move on to like add adjectives in front of the the words too. So he, nice. like what he does already, nice. he'll say like it's a yeah, it's purple nice. socks. It's a red shirt. Yeah, yo shoot. Blue shoot. Red shoot. Just to help expand his um, his language skills a lot more. Let's go, Jack Riley. You want to copy some here? That's hilarious. <laughs> That's so funny. You guys are so funny. Look at you guys. Are we buddies? Are we twins? Here, use your hand. What are you doing, Jack? Are we sitting? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think you are thirsty. Let's that's get you some water. So cute. And you even brought the chair over and everything. That's funny. Come on, let's get some milk, Jack. Say, oh. Come on, Suzanne. Cross yourself. Okay, let's go. Kala. Too much laughing and giggling in here. That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. That was the A word. And I want to remind you, you can watch this entire series from beginning to end wherever you would like to watch it. It's a wonderful, wonderful tool. And I'm going to come back and talk to you about that in just a second. But somebody, of course, it just came in. Somebody asked, what yoga poses did you use? And thanks. I am going to text uh, Sue and ask her. So but what, keep watching because I will get an answer for you. Um, in any case, I, that, I want to go back for just a second and talk about this particular A word. And one of the reasons why I love this, and I say it's a tool that we can all use is that many of you will write in and say well my child has one or two words but we haven't gotten to conversation I don't know how to get to conversation and and I, you guys have written in and said that about three-year-olds five-year-olds seven-year-olds 16 year olds right it's across the board and I this is where curriculum comes in and is in everything because I have seen many times in school settings where an aide will be working with an individual and again it could be a three-year-old a five-year-old seven-year-old a 17 year old right and they're working on language and they've been taught um, okay I, we're working on labels and I'm gonna add labels and that's what they've been taught how to do and but there's a disconnect sometimes of how do we get from you know dog and the, and the individual can say dog and they can do the list of things to get to the point where we get to conversation because you got to piece all these little things together and, you know, I'm a, I'm a teacher and it wasn't until I saw the card curriculum, which and the card curriculum is what is skills. Uh, so I want to encourage you go check out skills. Even if you just do the 14 day free trial, check it out. Go in and look at the language curriculum and look at the social curriculum uh, curriculum curriculum I can speak and go into the domain that's social language so those are the two areas that you really want to look at although there's a little bit more in academic um, the uh, the phenom uh, there's a bunch of sounds uh, that help with receptive language so maybe there's three areas that I want you to look at but um, uh, phonemic awareness. That's the word that I was looking for. Okay. Phonemic awareness. That's in the academic curriculum. Okay. So, but 
when I watch this unfold with my son, a lot like we're watching with Jack Riley, and it was very interesting to me to watch it unfold. And then what was equally interesting was to watch it unfold when my mother came to visit. And my mother was like, what are they doing? What on earth are they doing? They're just teaching him lists of things. How is that useful? How are you ever gonna get to language? She voiced every concern that I had had and then I had watched it happen so I knew what was happening and it was just so fascinating to watch her watch it then. And it was over a two day period and I have some of it videotaped actually because um, I wanted her to be able to see it so that I could show her but she was listening to it and watching it on the monitor. But the therapist would come in and uh, I remember just going, are you people nuts? Are you, you know, because first they taught him a bunch of different labels and then they taught him a bunch of different category labels and then they took all those things and they categorized those and then they took them and did features of them and the whole while they were working with frames. So they would start out by saying, you know, to, and he would get a reward. So in the beginning he would mand if they would hold something up and he would have to ask for it to get it. Um, and uh, so he would do that and then then they would add to it and he would have to say, I want. So if they had the, um, cause we didn't have iPads back then, uh, but we had the little portable DVD players. And so he would say movie, uh, or cartoon cause he wanted a little cartoon on the movie player. And then he would have to say, I want movie. Uh, his, there, I always say that we never used food and that's a little bit of a, a lie because there was one week in which we, uh, we used hot dogs because it was his favorite kind of food. And so he, I just, I, I know there's a videotape of him because I can picture it and hear it in my head that Peter Farrig was there with him and he was getting him to do something that was really difficult. And uh, it's so he, it, to lengthen that sentence and then we applied it to everything else. But uh, there was a plate of hot dogs and Jem would go to take one and Peter would just move it a little away and he would say, do you want, do you want the dog? Say dog. And, and Jem would say, dog. And then, uh, then, you know, a little bit later, he would, Peter would say to him, say, I want, and Peter would be saying that. And then Jem would say dog, right? So instead of giving it to him, he'd say, I want, and then Jem would say the dog. And then eventually by the end of the week, he, uh, Peter would say, I, and then Jem would say, want dog. Right? <laughs> and then it was always with this, you know, big effort because it was a big effort. But by the end of the week, Jem was saying, I want dog, please. Right. <laughs> and two weeks later, he was saying, mama, I want more dog. So I want you to know that that very rote, I want dog turned into within two weeks. Mama, I want more dog, please. More dog. And then it was, uh, can I have more hot dog, please? You know, so it happens, but you have to be able to string the elements in. And honestly, it's a lot of work to figure out what the curriculum is to get all of the pieces of all of these categories together. And, and I remember when we were working on features and categories, and I got it when they were working on, they would show him like a violin. He was very into music. And we would go to this regular um, event. It was called a petting zoo at an orchestra. And I remember saying to my husband, what's a, why is a petting zoo at an orchestra? But we went and what it was that they would lay out all the instruments from the orchestra and the kids could go through and try them and they would disinfect them in between those that they had to blow on. But it was amazing for Jem because he actually got to do hands on and, and do the violin and do the cello and blow the bassoon and, you know, anything he wanted to. We just had to stand in line and take our turn and he, turn and he was willing to stand in line for that. So they one of the sets of labels that they taught him were all the different musical instruments because it was what he was interested in. And I was thinking, how is this going to help with conversation? I really don't like shouldn't be we be working on other things. Um, but then they taught taught him the category of musical instruments. Instruments. And then they taught him the features of this one has a reed and this one has a bow and this one has um, keys on it and, uh, you know, all those different things, because otherwise he couldn't have a conversation about the thing he wanted to talk about which were the instruments. And they did that with cars, but I got it, I fully got it once they put all the pieces together with the musical instruments. And I heard him saying, you know, mama, I want to play the, the bassoon because it has a reed and, 
you know, he had all the words and before he had another words. When my mom was visiting, they were doing features of animals and they were talking about wings and they were talking about tails and they were talking about ears and they were talking about fur and feathers and all those different things. And at the same time, they were doing vehicles, different features of vehicles. Um, so first they had had to learn all the different animal names and then, and all the different uh, names of like an airplane and a motorcycle and a truck and a car and you know a boat and all those different things and then they would talk about the features of them so he got this sense of oh these are all vehicles and vehicles are things that move and and transport things and people and then he understood that a boat you know doesn't have the wheels and an airplane has the wings and so on and so forth so same thing with the animals he learned all the animals names and then he learned this these have feathers and these have fur and these have two feet and these have four feet and this has eight legs and all these different features so that he had a global understanding of the language of what these things were how they were alike, how they were similar how they fit into a category then they went on to food like vegetables and all those things but I, I remember that that it was, there was a moment, and I'm pretty sure that we have it on videotape, where they had been teaching this and teaching about, you know, what is this? It's a, and he would say, it's a bird. And they would say to him, what does a bird have? And, you know, and he was a little confused. And, you know, they would say, a bird has. And he, and they would show him, and he would feel on a little play school thing, the, you know, he'd say, wings, bird has wings. And there was a moment when finally they were talking about vehicles, and he just turned to them and said, car has doors and wheels. <laughs> and just, you know, I, and I just remember Peter being so excited, my mother going, he figured it out. It might as well have been, uh, you know, uh, Helen Keller uh, with Annie Sullivan, you know, understanding water and then getting doll. My mother was jumping around and hugging me and going, he figured it out. I just watched him learn it. It's amazing. So I want you to know that the curriculum is an important part of this. And you don't have to be working with CARD to have the curriculum. It's all there for you on skills. You can subscribe to it. Your child's therapist can subscribe to it. Your child's school can subscribe to it. But if you haven't gotten to the point, if you're getting the labels and you're not getting to the conversation, make sure that they've got the curriculum, that they've got the vision, that they understand the through line. Make sure that you understand the through line. And if you don't already have something else, and I'm not aware of anything else that does it like this, use skills. If for nothing else, use it for that so that you get all those pieces together so that all of a sudden the flower blooms and the language happens. You see it happening with Jack Riley. The pieces are coming together. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I've gone on and on and on. But uh, we've been saving uh, an interview that we did with a wonderful young woman. Courtney um, is... Uh, I think she's 19 years old and she has an Asperger diagnosis. Uh, I believe that she also has a diagnosis of Tourette's and, uh, and there is cerebral palsy as well. And um, so things aren't as easy for her as they would be for somebody else, a lot of somebody else's, but that doesn't stop her. This is an amazing young woman who's got no moss grown under her feet. She started and is an integral part of a chorus that is full of people of different abilities. She, this girl moves and shakes. She's got a lot to do in this life. And we had a wonderful interview with her via Skype and we've been saving it to show you. So here is Courtney Reeves. Welcome back to Autism Live. We are very excited because we have a very special guest who is joining us live via Skype all the way from England. She is a unique young lady who is so inspirational. Courtney Reeve is with us. She is 17 years old. There's Courtney. Hi, Courtney. Hi, Jasmine. Hi. Hey, yeah, <laughs> We're so thrilled to have you on the show, Courtney. Uh, we've been trying to arrange this for a while. But uh, Courtney is 17 years old. She has cerebral palsy. And a year ago, she was telling us she was recently diagnosed with mild Asperger's as well. But Courtney has no moss growing under her feet. She's very busy <laughs> uh, and has a lot of things going on. And 
I, I understand that not too long ago, you decided that there was something that you wanted to fix. Tell our audience at home what your fixer's project was and why you chose it. Well, yeah, uh, I mean, it depends on if you want the long story or the short story. Okay, well, I, I have time. Let's do the medium story. Can we do the medium story? Well, it all started when I was in year nine when I was doing singing lessons with um, a music teacher who's, who's in the video. I don't play the video or the picture project on live. I'm not sure and if you are or not. And, well, yeah, so I so. So you've got an interest in music. You like music. You think that it's great fun. And has be, participating in music been good for you? Yeah, it hasn't helped me with my direct recording with my beat. It's kind of the therapy. But also, like, it's a great way to make friends and improve people with additional needs. And suddenly those on the autumn that friends no matter where they go on the back friends. I mean, I, it all kind of started when I was in year nine. Um, and so you you think that this is something that not only has it helped you, but it's something that can help others. So that, so you that, wanted to uh, to create a choir uh, so that a whole bunch of people could get together and have that opportunity to sing together. So what did you do? Well, that goes back a bit to what I was trying to tell you in year nine. We met this story, I met this story called Luke Batmonton, who had, who was on, who had, who was on the set, autism spectrum, and he was having a bad, bad um, time. So I wrote this song called Home, which I wrote, and we raised 75 pounds for the National Autism Society, which is a charity here in England. Um, and children and adults with autism and other relating to daughters. So I teamed up with them and we raised over to five pounds just with CDs that had no door loads on them. We had a load of that raised money for one load of which was the National Autistic Society. I don't know if you heard of that. No. Is that a CD that we can still get? Well, I don't even know. No. <laughs> but it, then, it's just one song, it called Hope, and we did it in the United and we raised over to five pounds for all to them, and it was in five pounds by Luke who had. That's and really it, remarkable, Courtney. Pardon? That's really remarkable because, you know, a lot of people, um, are overwhelmed with the things that they have going on and they don't find time to help other people. And I think that you're an inspiration to everybody because there are probably some who look at you and think you, you've you got some challenges, right? Yeah, I have, and it has not been easy. But, you know, the best way to help others is to give hope. I know that you guys love hope. We on do. Autism lies because we talk about it all the time. Yes, it's our favorite four-letter word, Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> so, Courtney, you're 17 years old. What What's your plan? What are you going to do next? Um, well, I do do the choir every Tuesday during term time. I don't feel like old high school. And I work with children with autism and addiction needs, so it's really, really cool. And then we also have a, a we do a couple of projects with the choir, and then we have some other projects um, outside the choir with my church, and also the talking to other families through, and uh, Rick, I don't know if it will be too later or now, whenever you want to. 
Well, I think that you're absolutely remarkable, Courtney, and I'm so thrilled that you watch the show and thrilled to give you an opportunity to give people some hope, our favorite four-letter word. Uh, and I can't wait. I I can't wait to see all the things that you're going to do in your life, Courtney, because you're remarkable. Yeah, and I mean, let's go right to the beginning when I was actually born and I was born with no hope. My parents were just giving me hope because I nearly died when I was born. I stopped breathing and they had to bring me back to life. But also, I, I see people, and I think people actually don't want no hope whatsoever to actually have a friend or a child or a community where they can be themselves. And if we can do that with the choir, we can do that wherever it comes to. And it all funding and inclusion. Inclusion doesn't work for everyone. And, you know, we call it that inclusion in education, inclusion in class. But sometimes inclusion can run the community at large. How are we going to teach inclusion in society where we don't actually do it on TV? We don't have many characters with autism on TV that actually uh that people actually on the spectrum. The then with no then with the storm writers. So we talk about how important inclusion is that we actually don't join practice in media and in media and movies and T V shows and this and that we we had some amazing movies that we need more, we need more awareness to the abilities, as well as some of the challenges, and some of the challenges I faced through bullying and people not quite understanding my disabilities, but, you know, it's all, the only way you do right? And, you know, you have tried to commit to a line, I have tried to and the life on all the modern patients that that level of opportunity is really there. Well, yeah. I agree with you. And be careful, Courtney, because some Hollywood producer may see you and decide that the, they need to bring you to Hollywood to be on TV or be in a movie or something <laughs> like that so oh that you God. can show the world. <clears throat> and break down some of those barriers. We uh, we so appreciate you, Courtney. We're, we're out of time, unfortunately, but I thank you so much. For... <laughs> we're just getting started. <laughs> I, but we can have you on another time. We can absolutely have you on another time. I think, Courtney, that it's time for you to write your book. Oh, uh, yeah, I thought that I'm not doing it because I'm only 17. But you can write a book at 17 and it. write another one at 21. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have a lot to say, and it's a lot that the world needs to hear. But and also, also, can I ask all your students to do something for me? What's that? Well, we are actually on your Facebook. Private messenger on yours, not authorized yours, about my grand challenge, who's an amazing autism man. She's a highly 22 year old child called Luke, who has ADHD, Asperger's syndrome, and Cranidiasty. And she is phenomenal. And she actually wrote a bit about her life with. Live and with their life with ADHD and autism and plans, I say, and all that. And also, and the other challenges they face with education and with friendships and with family, and they are absolutely amazing. So, I nominated her for an award. Uh -huh. I wanted you guys with not 
I be willing to go on the National Diversity Award, Jesus Christ, and to do and then what you do. It's, uh, it's National Digest Award? National Digest Award. One day, I just try and put this out. You know, we, we have the link, and what we'll do is we'll make sure that we put it on our Facebook. Yeah. How's and then that? What, what you do is then run like and just type that on the thing. On your, yeah, on your. He doesn't look from her down as other people with autism. And she actually wrote a bit about it with like on the edge and beyond. Really hard, really. You know, one hell of a drug when the police go, she's the one lady in the night, and up there, dog. And he does not do her dumb like this, and lady, and her dumb in North Hall, her dumb thing to meet the queen, meet David Cameron, and that all these amazing people. And she, he did what it was, AED and autism, where it's amazing. Okay. So we need to vote for her. Yeah. Okay. So we will do that, and we'll put the link up on our Facebook uh, to share that. But I, but we're out of time now. But Courtney, thank you so much. We'll have you back again on the show sometime. And when you write your book, <laughs> I'm not writing a book. I can't write a book. I can't even spell. I think you will at some point, Courtney. I really think you will. And I have a sixth sense about these things. But anyway. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us, and uh, we'll we'll touch base with you again in the future. And thank you for for watching the show and for being such an inspiration to us. Well, I did say that, and it, and I honestly on your journey because what you do is it doesn't help to parents around the world, Shannon. And I, I don't know what is Alex Trump going to do that on the show? I'm sorry, say that again? What is Alex going to do on the show with him? Alex Plank? Alex, oh, Alex Plank. Oh, you know what he's doing right now? He is working on the show The Bridge. And yeah. as, as soon as The Bridge is on hiatus again, which will be closer to summer, we will have Alex back again. And I will make sure and tell Alex that he has a fan <laughs> in England. He'll love that. Uh, he, yeah. Uh, he's pretty cute, too, Courtney, uh, I have to say. Uh, if you come to L.A., you have to make sure and let me know, and I'll make sure that you get to meet Alex. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to embarrass you. Uh, but it'll, you'll, you'll love to meet Alex, and Alex would love to meet you. Uh, okay, they're going to they're gonna boot me off the air now, Courtney. But thank you so much for being with us. You want to, you know, and you're bringing hope too. We're doing it together. Si se puede, yeah. right? We do this like together. You always say we've got the whole hand with everyone to work together. We've got the whole hand. No, 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 That's right. right. We have to hold hands to do this. So, uh, anyway, thank you so much, Courtney. Any last words that you want to say? Yeah, well, love it. That mother actually made a different state to me. <laughs> and, well, yeah, it's just like, um, they try on believing that you're, it doesn't matter where your child is, non verbal or has adverted. And what I'm working on at the moment is working on community projects like car washes and meals or meals and and other, I've got loads of projects in my working on that that don't like today. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Courtney, and we'll we'll be in touch. All right, say bye bye. Do that. Bye bye. And that was Courtney Reeve joining us from England, an inspirational young woman, 17 years old, and doing things for other people and talking about how important hope is. What an inspiration she is to all of us. We're going to take a break and be back with more of Autism Live after these messages. Hi, this is Lisa Ackerman. Welcome back to Talk of Facts. 
frequently asked questions and answers for the autism journey. Now this one is specifically for teens and adults with autism. I get this question all the time, what's new and exciting in the medical world uh, today for teens and adults with autism? So let's talk about them. TMS, Transmagnetic Stimulation Therapy, is something that is really exciting. Um, I met with the author, John Robeson, look me in the eye. He's a, a gentleman with Asperger's and something I hope all of our kids to strive and grow up and be just like him. He's amazing. He talked about TMS therapy and how he became more social aware. His smile was more natural and I definitely can better understand things around him in those social settings. Another really great treatment um, that we're seeing just a ton of research on in the last three years is cerebral folate autoimmunity. You know in the 90s they started putting folate in all of our different foods and products. Well some people they have found out and specifically a high percentage of children with autism don't process folate like what how they should. Go figure, they don't do it the way the books say it's gonna happen. So cerebral folate autoimmunity is just a really exciting new therapeutic to work with your physician on and to look to see if your child is a candidate for that therapy. And another common thing that we're seeing in teens and adults, and we've talked about it before in Talk of Facts, is seizures. Very serious issue that needs to be looked at. Um, abnormal brain waves or brain patterns or epileptic activity in the brain definitely needs to be addressed in children with autism. Again, I'm not a doctor, but I know doctors that can go through and work and look at the, the child and perform a 24-hour EG. What they're finding with some of these anticonvulsant or seizure medications is kids start to make great gains in speech, cognition, sleep, learning, by treating any type of seizure activity. So, and the other issue is pandas, not the cute fuzzy bears that we see in the zoo, uh, but an issue that is happening with a lot of teens and adults on the spectrum, where you see a dramatic change in behaviors um, with these individuals, and often they have an inappropriate immune response. Taka has a great white paper, so you can go look up in the pandas definition, what to test and treat for and talk to your doctor about, but know that if you see an extreme swing in behavior with a child um, that goes from one place to a very negative place, we're seeing a lot of uh, teens positively responding to treatments for pandas. Uh, and the last tr treatment I wanted to talk about, um, and I'm super excited about, and this happens to not just work with younger kids on the autism spectrum, but also older children on the spectrum, teens and adults, it's called mendability. Um, and a great study just came out of UCI in May 2013 about a multi-sensory approach uh, for individuals with autism. The whole premise behind the therapy uh, is very simple, making it a sensory rich environment so neural connections can make new pathways or at least connect in that individual. So kids with sensory issues, uh, auditory listening issues, uh, speech issues, they seem to really just respond to mendability and uh, I was so excited to see that new research. More research is being done on it and the beautiful, beautiful part about mendability is it's something parents can do on their own, administer with their child and be uh, connected to their kid as partners in the autism journey. Don't forget in any therapy or medical intervention to work with your physician and to do proper testing to know what your child needs and what treatments to pursue under a physician's care. So there's so many new things I could go on for hours about new treatments and excitement, but there's the top ones that just have me so geeked here. But that's another talk of fact. Thanks for joining me and we'll see you next time and on Real Journey, Real Questions and Answers to help your autism journey. Welcome back to Autism Live. So first of all, we want to thank Courtney so much for doing that interview with us. Uh, very, very inspirational uh, to us. And I have uh, texted Sue Cho asking for yoga poses. If I know she was going into another training, so if she doesn't get them to us by the end of the show today, I will promise you that I will make sure that I speak with her about that and give you that answer for, on tomorrow's show. Because uh, I'm sure she can come up with some uh, asanas for us. 
Olympics uh, poses for our kids to do. In any case, uh, I wanted to remind all of you, you just saw Lisa Ackerman from Taka that this weekend in Costa Mesa, California, they're doing their three-day West Coast Conference. It's Friday starting, I believe, uh, afternoon, and then Saturday and Sunday, ending earlier on Sunday. And Lisa is one of the speakers who will be speaking about hope. You know that's our favorite four-letter word. And, uh, and she's also part of the parent panel that she and her husband will be part of the parent panel. A so you have an opportunity to meet Lisa. That in and of itself is a reason to go to the TACA uh, conference the Real Hope Now conference, but also Holly Riley and her husband will be on that panel along with Dr. Dan Rosignol, who is the head of the MAPS uh, organization, will be there with his wife on that parent panel as well. Uh, you guys, it just really doesn't get any better than that. And then I'm looking to see, um, I, I, there are other parents too, and I just don't know who, who it is that's on there. But in any case, I uh, hope that you get a chance to go to that. Now, since we're talking about the parent panel and we're talking about parenthood, I didn't get a chance to say this on Thursday. Kind of glad that I didn't because I want to talk about it um, now. And I'm hoping that most of you got an opportunity on Thursday by now, if you DVR'd it, that you've had a chance to watch it. I'm not going to give too much away but you know that parenthood is starting their very last their sixth and final season and uh and if you watch the show you know that i absolutely love this show and that i think that it's incredible and that it's done so much for the autism community and in fact there was an article recently in buzzfeed if you got a chance to read it how parenthood broke down the autism awareness barrier and this is written by emily orley she had the wonderful opportunity and i I'm chartreuse with envy, Emily, that you got to interview Jason Kadams. We have begged, we have pleaded. I have uh, offered anything that I will come whenever it is convenient that I would like to interview Jason Kadams. Um, and thus far, he's been just too busy. So, but uh, he had time for Emily and I am chartreuse with envy. I'm not holding it against you, Jason. I still love you and I still love your show. Anyway, it's a great article. Check it out in BuzzFeed. Uh, again, the title is How Parenthood Broke Down the Autism Awareness Barrier. And she also interviewed our wonderful friend, Matt Asner, um, there are quotes from uh, from him as well, so uh, definitely check that out. But I just wanted to say support this show because they support us and hope that all of you are watching. Here's what I love and why I feel like parenthood has broken down uh, barriers is that as soon as parenthood started, all my friends were watching it, um, all my friends who don't have children on the autism spectrum, and they were watching it for all of the storylines one of them just happened to be autism. Now, if it had been a show where autism was featured more often um, so that it was the only storyline, I don't know if my friends would have been as in tune to it as they were and are. But I, I always can tell when I have a whole host of friends who will watch and then they will post afterwards and sometimes they will email me or Facebook me and say, hey, I just watched this and I just wanted to know, was that what it's like for you? And you know what? Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it is not my experience. And I'm able to say, you know what? That's not what it's like for us, but that's what it's like for other people. Um, and it opened a doorway to a conversation where I see I'm getting emotional, where people talk to us about what was really happening with us. And I think that I'm a good communicator, but I had not been able to bridge that on my own with my friends. They didn't really understand what we were going through and they didn't know how to ask and they didn't know what to ask. And parenthood made it possible for them to ask me some things and then say, is it okay that I'm asking you this? And for me to say, yes, ask all the questions that you want. So uh, I know I'm not the only one. Anytime I've been any place with autism parents, we've had a conversation about how helpful it's been. And we've all been able to pick different things about the show that make us feel like we're not alone on this planet. And I have to say, uh, as much as I love all the characters on the show, of course I have a sweet spot for the mom. And I've said before that if this family were real, we would have that mom on this show to talk about the school that she is starting for her son. She would have already been on Autism Live. You know she would have been on Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. And listen, Jason Kadams, if you're paying attention, we'd love if you want to have that character on here, we'll interview her as the character. We would be thrilled to have her on the show. 
But I will say, too, that uh, the, for the dad, the character of the dad, this is the character that I identify with the most. Um, the rest of the family who is moving at the speed of light and has all their problems and feel that those are the only problems in the world and run to him for advice and sometimes miss that he could use the shoulder. Uh, absolutely love that. And I, I so appreciate, there was a moment in this last week's Parenthood where I stood up in my living room and started applauding. Didn't even know my body was doing it, but stood up and applauded because I went, yes, someone needed to say that. Oh, Jason Kadams. Jason Kadams, we love you so. And we love parenthood. We are, we're fastening the seatbelts for this last, uh, last season, sixth season. So thrilled and so privileged to have this in our lives and to have had it for the last five seasons and for this last very special one. If you're not watching parenthood, you're missing out. Watch it. We're going to take a break and we are going to come back to talk about support. What support looks like, how you can get it, how you can ask for it. Stick with us. Hello, activists. I've been sharing with you my 10 steps of empowerment for parents of children with autism. Now I'd like to share with you something that I read when my spirits get down from time to time. It's called Anyway. People are unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Love them anyway. If you do good, people will accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Do good anyway. If you are successful, you will win false and true enemies. Succeed anyway. The good you do will be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Honesty and frankness make you vulnerable. Be honest and frank anyway. When you spend years building, it may be destroyed overnight. Build anyway. People really need help, but may attack you if you help them. Help people anyway. Give the world the best you've got and you'll get kicked in the teeth. Give the world the best you've got anyway. That's not from some self-help guru. That's from a sign hanging on the wall of the children's home in Calcutta where Mother Teresa ministered to the poorest of the poor. I'd like to say that the world of autism can be a very challenging and daunting one. But do the best you can to live in it and love in it to the fullest. Live it anyway. Hey, that was Nancy Allspot Jackson. She's going to be here with me tomorrow for Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. We have a wonderful guest who's going to be with us, Inez Cooperschmidt, who is from Learning Rights. They are a legal advocate uh, organization here in Los Angeles, and we can't wait to talk with her. Uh, and if you have questions about legal things, about IEPs, and about supports and placement and things of that nature, be writing them in tonight because Inez will be with us tomorrow and so will Nancy. Can't wait uh, for that. Don't forget too that Dr. Doreen Grandpache will be here in the morning and she'll be answering your questions. Now, I promised you guys that we were going to talk a little bit about getting support, how we get support, what kinds of different supports are out there, and how we ask for it. So let's break it down for just a second in terms of, you know, I, I whenever we talk about if you're newly diagnosed um, or new to the autism community or newly refreshed that, you know, you maybe you've took a, took a little time away and said, you know, having some trouble with this and I'm coming back. One of the most important things that you can do to get started on the right path is find support for yourself. Now, this is if you are the teacher, if you are the practitioner, if you are the parent, or if you are the individual who's on the autism spectrum. It's this, in this respect, it's one size fits all. Nothing else is, but this is get support for yourself. And support can look lots of different ways. For parents, I really recommend that you get yourself two things, a local support group online and a more global support group online that fits your individual needs. You can find these on things like Cafe Mom, Yahoo Groups, um, Facebook, 
Um, you know, there are all different kinds of uh, social networking um, sites that you can go to um, that can help you to connect with different things. Uh, I love the Aut Spot. Uh, there's my autism team. There are lots of different ways that you can connect. Um, I will tell you that the support group that I found that was local that worked for me was a Taka support group. And they have support groups in lots of different areas. You can go on Google groups or Yahoo groups. The one that I belong to is on Yahoo groups. And it, you know, you register and you have to say why you want to be a part of the group. For most of these groups, they want you to identify yourself. It's not that you have to give your whole life story or that they're judging you, but these groups are meant for parents to be able to talk to parents Parents and there's no marketing. There is no marketing whatsoever. Like I, you know, I, I've, I backed off of my local support group because I found myself wanting to say, Hey, you guys need to watch on the show. We're going to have whatever. And it's a fine line because even though, you know, it's not selling anything because this is free information, it's still, you know, I don't, I don't want parents, other parents to feel like, nor do I, when I'm there asking for help, feel like, you know, we keep things separate. We keep things separate. So just know that they're going to be asking you questions and don't feel huffy about that because the reason for it is that when you get there and you ask questions, somebody's not going to come into the conversation and say, oh, you should try this treatment that I do. You want to be able to talk to parents in a really free and open way. So I belong to a Taka group on Google groups and or Yahoo groups, excuse me. And um, Yahoo gives you different settings you can do so that you can get an email every time somebody emails in, in, and asks a question. And for the first year, that's exactly what I did. And I would look at it and see what the thread was and, and all of that. Or, and this is what I changed to later on, you could subscribe to the Daily Digest. So I get a daily message letting me know what the discussion was in the Google group. And I can go through and look at it and say, oh, you know, uh, somebody was asking, does anybody know a good dentist in Woodland Hills, right? And if I want to, I can chime into the conversation or I can read it like a newspaper. And I have to say to you that a lot of time I read that as a newspaper because, and there were things that people would ask questions about kids that were teenagers and it didn't have anything to do with me. And there was a time when they were talking about kids that were talking and that didn't have anything to do with me later on that did have to do with me and someday those those teenage questions will have something to do with me and it was worthwhile to read those just because it's kind of like watching a movie of where you're going to drive to you it's not the same as being there but you get a feel for what the landmarks are i've never been to mount rushmore but if i ever am there i'm going to know what i'm looking at because i've seen pictures of it right and i'm going to experience it in my own special way and i'm going to want to check out mount rushmore in my own way but i'm not unaware of where mount rushmore is and the fact that i can go visit it and that that if I suddenly find myself there, I will know what it is exactly that I'm looking at. Same thing with autism. I want, I want to see other people's roadmaps. I want to see their pictures of their journey and have an idea of what might be coming up so that I can prepare at least mentally, if not in other ways. Um, so I encourage you, and it's so important to get a local support group because you are going to need to use services locally. I will also tell you that Love My Provider, another great thing that's growing in different places that seeks to do exactly that for you so that if you can rate things and say, I went to this dentist, I went to this hair salon, and they were just so patient and so good, or they really had no patience and wouldn't allow my child to use the bathroom, right? Keeping it real and keeping it honest. Um, but but your support groups can do that for you too. And, and then the global the global one is because all of our kids are different, but there is something about being in a rainstorm and recognizing somebody who has the exact same umbrella that you have, right? That you feel like, okay, we're in this together. And, uh, you know, when my son started school, there was another child that was in his class who was on the autism spectrum. They were the same age, lived in the same community, in the same class with the same teachers. These two little boys couldn't have been more different. And we just had a play date the other day, the two of them back together, and they're like two peas in a pod, and they play so well together, but they are night and day different. They're just different. They're their own individual people, and they need different things, and they need different supports. And, you know, why shouldn't they be completely different? Because all the other kids were completely different, too. So just the fact that they share autism doesn't mean, you know, they fit in the same. They don't. They don't at all. And 
And I talk with that mom all the time. We've had her on the show before. Um, and I, amazing mom tells me all kinds of things that I need to know about biomedical and helps support me in that way. And I try to support her in my own way. And yet there are things that each of us need from other people that, you know, I want to say to people, what do you do for when your child it just keeps asking you the same question over and over again? Or what do you do about this? And I needed to find moms and dads and other parts of the world who had kids that were more specifically like mine. You know, we talk about autisms, not autism. Um, and so the types of autism that these two boys had different. And I, it's been very helpful to me to find kids who are just like my son. It helps me to oomph the progress. When I know, when I see somebody else who had the same trajectory as our kid and they, and they say, oh, well, you know, we did this eventually and that really helped. Oh, you know, that's exciting stuff. So one that's really local and one that's really global where you get to know. So if you have a child who is not speaking, that you're going to find that global support group for kids who are not speaking. If you have a child that is, you know, let's say grinding their teeth, you can find groups where people, it gets that specific. Look around, see what you can find. Uh, and if you don't find what you're looking for, you can do what Lisa Ackerman did, which is start your own support group like Taka. And I will tell you that in Taka, you will find parents who have experienced at some point or other pretty much everything that you've experienced and can give you um, answers about what it was like for them. So I encourage you to get that kind of support group. Now there are support groups where you can actually get together and meet and bless you if you can find that and get to the meeting at the time and not have it conflict with your child's therapy. That was always impossible for me. I realize it's not impossible for other people have IEF skills and can manage their time in a way and their schedule. I could not do that. But if you can, hooray for you. Um, for those of you who are on the spectrum, I, one of the things that I want to say to you is go run, do not walk to wrongplanet.com. Net, wrongplanet.net, which was invented by a young man who we love here on the show and he's a regular. He's not with us at this period, at this time of the year, because he's so busy being the consultant on the bridge that he has no time for us. And I say that like uh, a, a forlorn mother, mother hen, because Alex Plank is just wonderful. And watch some of the videos that we've done with Alex Plank, and he'll be back uh, probably when the bridge is on siesta. Uh, but uh, wrongplanet.net is one of the best places that you can go if you are a computer savvy individual and you want to meet other individuals to ask them questions and to get support and find helpful information, wrongplanet.net. For our uh, teachers and practitioners, uh, there are uh, behavior analysts for autism on Facebook. I'm pretty sure that that's the page. It's one of the best resource groups that I know and I subscribe to it and they, I see the, the talk that they do. They share articles. People come in and ask questions and say, I need more information about this. Uh, really remarkable and I'm sure that there are more. That's just the one that I'm more familiar with. So important that you give yourself that gift. There are newsletters for all kinds of things out there. You can use these groups like a newsletter. You don't have to show up and be the secretary and bake the coffee cake and do all those things uh, because they're mostly centered on being online. You can drop in and be a part of the conversation at Tuesday at two o'clock or at Thursday at 9 p.m. if that's when is convenient for you. And convenience is a big part of this, right? Because we have other things that are time sensitive that we need to deal with. So I want to encourage you to start at least with the online support. And then from there, branch into some of the organizations like TACA, um, like Autism Care and Treatment Today, like the Special Needs Network, like uh, the Art of Autism like Autism Speaks, there are all, like the Holly Rod Foundation, there are all these organizations that are out there, and so many more that I didn't mention, who could use your help. And I can tell you that everyone that I've ever met 
uh, that has a child on the autism spectrum des describes a moment, and it comes at some point along the journey, when you, you know, at first you have to be all intensive on your family, making sure that you got your ducks in a row. But there's a moment when you know that you do because you realize, ah, it's time for me to take my seat at this table. And you find your own way. And all of us, it's different, but you find the way that makes your heart sing that you know that you're making a difference and paying it forward. And you will find that organization and and that's when there is a shift. And when you get to that moment, and it takes a while, it's not the, it doesn't come in the first week. For a lot of us, it didn't come in the first year. But when you get to that moment, when you're involved in giving back, you feel whole again. You feel like this all, there's a certain amount of sense and synergy, and it changes the way you look at why did this happen to me. It's powerful. You'll know it when you get there, but trust me, everybody I know that's been on this journey that has been here for very long gets to that moment and describes it as a very peaceful moment, a uh, very fulfilling moment. All right, we're going to take a short break, and then we're going to come back to close out the show. But get yourself the support, whatever you need, in whatever way you can. Get the support. It's important. Stick with us. What is autism? 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 Uh, <laughs> I've been asking myself that for a very, very long time. Um, let me think about that one. <laughs> um, trying to, uh, just, uh... Um... Jeez, let me think. <laughs> Oh man, that's a tough one. Yes. Uh, autism. Uh, uh, autism is a neurological disorder that affects many of our kids in different ways. It's a learning disability that affects the cognitive functions of the brain. A lot of people have the misconception that it's a disability, and it's really not. I look at it as like a special gift. When one person thinks differently from another, it's an opportunity for everyone to learn to understand someone that's a little different than them. Autism is the ability to educate. They're given. So much talent in different areas. To me, autism means a chance to be with and be around people you really care about. Autism is beautiful. It's a way of seeing the world differently. It's always unique, totally intelligent, and sometimes mysterious. Happiness that, that, that comes out of my um, son's um, hard work. It's a movement. Unpredictable. That's right. Awesome. Love. The field I want to work in. Laughter. Fun. Joy. Autism is beautiful to me. I want you to remember these three words. There is hope. Welcome back to Autism Live. Uh, we're here at the end of the show today, but it gives me an opportunity to give you some programming notes about tomorrow and the rest of this week and next week. So uh, just an FYI, tomorrow, Dr. Doreen Grambache will be here. She's going to be answering your questions live. We've already got a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, I hope you guys send in a bunch more. Then tomorrow after uh, Ask Dr. Doreen is Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. Nancy Alspaugh Jackson will be here with me. Our special guest is Inez Cooper Schmidt. I hope I'm saying the name correctly. Uh, she is from Learning Rights Law uh, Advocates, and they do an amazing job. It's the first time we're having them on the show, and I couldn't be more thrilled. Um, and they're, we're going to be talking with her about all kinds of legal issues and how we get support for all of that and some of the differences that they're making in the world. Then on Thursday, Thursday is pretty exciting. We're going to have Dr. Adele Nadowski with us and she's going to be answering your questions as is Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. And we're also going to have Jennifer Jones with us. She's going to be talking with us about a really fun kickoff for the Orange County Autism Speaks Walk, which is coming up in December. But you know, they always do a kickoff, which is sort of like the pre party for the event to start raising money and that's coming up in just a couple of weeks and this is again the Orange County Walk. Now I know for those of you who don't live in California sometimes you go oh we're hearing more about California but as I always say so goes California so often goes the rest of the United States and the rest of the world and I think it's worthwhile for us to be able to show you the resources that are here because if you know what's available here it sets a bar for you to know 
what you may or may not want uh, for yourself where you are. So it's a wonderful opportunity to have Jennifer here with us in the studio to talk about this wonderful kickoff. Now next week, we are not here live. So we are taking a brief hiatus. My son has fall break. I just, I just don't understand this. We didn't have this back east. And you know I grew up back east, so I don't know. But uh, it is a wonderful little vacation that we get to do and have some excitement around fall activities. So in a way, I've, I've quite embraced it, but we won't be here doing shows. Uh, we will be back the week after, and oh my goodness, you guys, that's when we start our big push through getting ready for all of the holidays that are gonna come our way. <clears throat> Excuse me, and even on Thursday, we're gonna be talking with Dr. Nadowski and Dr. Tarbox about what we need to be doing today to get our kids ready for when we set the clocks uh, for a different time and what we need to be doing today to start our kids to be ready for Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. We need to get ahead of this curve, right? Be doing some systematic desensitization now so that we're not caught off guard. There's some rehearsing we can do. Oh, it's going to be so much fun. And in a way, it kind of stretches out the holidays. And you'll see, I used to despair and think that, is my son ever going to enjoy the holidays? Is that ever going to happen? Or is it just going to be this, uh, that uh, it, big expectation on my part and then, you know, tantrum on his part? It works. So we're going to start taking that under advisement this week. We're completely out of time, but I want to thank all of our guests for being here today. Sue Cho, who is absolutely amazing, and the wonderful Janice Kern, and of course, Courtney Reeve for being with us. We hope you go to that Real Help Now Taka conference. Uh, we're out of time, but I will see you tomorrow for Ask Dr. Doreen. And until then, please give your kiddos a hug from me. Bye-bye for now.